Have you ever lost your phone? Or maybe your keys, your keys or your phone. Okay, some of you guys don't lose things, but if you're like me, you lost your phone and then literally like everything else got put on hold. Like you couldn't, if you're like me, I couldn't move on with my day until I found like, oh my gosh, everybody stop, gotta find the phone because like I can't function in life without the phone. Maybe it's your car key because you can't go to work without your key or whatever. And it's like, oh, and maybe that's just me. But what I've learned is that when you lose something that's valuable, it's, it's a big deal, especially if that thing you lost is one of your kids. <laughs> a couple, couple months ago, uh, I'm at my son's baseball game. Uh, Judah's playing baseball, and he, I'm there with his two brothers, Levi and Zion. Zion's five at the time. He's the, the youngest. And so we're watching Judah play baseball. His brothers aren't really watching him. They're playing with the other kids and all that. Anyways, the baseball game ends, and we're getting ready to go. We're getting in the car, and Judah's there, and Levi's there. And I'm like, guys, where's Zion? And they're like, because I'm, I'm looking around. I can't find him. I'm like, guys, where is Zion? And they're like, oh, I think he went to the skate park. Now, the skate park is at the same park, but it's literally like a quarter mile on the other side of the park. And so I'm like, he went to the skate park? What in the world? Get in the car. So, like, it's far enough. We got to drive across the park. So I'm like, let's go, guys. Let's go. Get in the car. Come on. And I go into, like, dad mode of, like, shoot, I just lost my kid. <laughs> this is not good. And so they get in the car. We drive across to the skate park. We're at the skate park. I pull up. I'm not seeing him. I'm starting to get nervous on the inside, you know. And I'm like, guys, jump out. We, everybody search everywhere. We got to find Zion. And so they're all looking. We're looking down in the bowls and everything. And it's like, okay, Zion's not here. Get back in the car, guys. Come on. Like, shoot, he's not at the skate park. He must be back at the other side of the park. So we drive back across. In those few moments, it's, a, it's not that far. It's a quarter mile across this multiple parking lots, basically. My heart starts to beat faster. I'm starting to get nervous. Shoot, I lost my kid. I'm imagining he's probably freaking out wherever he is. We pull up to... Uh, to the other part where we were, and it's like cars are coming in out of this parking lot, and there's Zion, he's crying. He's like, ah. I open the door of the car, he runs up, we're like blocking the traffic, and he's just hugging, ah. he's just crying. You know, I'm just like, thank you, God, I found him, you know. Um, but in, in those few moments, it was probably five, ten minutes, really, that he was, he was lost for, it seemed like hours to me. Now imagine in those few moments if my other kids would have been like, Dad, we want ice cream. Come on, take us. I would have been like, dude, shut up. I don't care what you want. Your brother is lost. Like, what's your problem? Or if they started fighting, like, Dad, we're hungry. We want lunch. Take us to McDonald's. And I'd be like, shut up. Like, like, I care about you, I love you, but your brother's lost, come on. And when something is lost, the things that are found that you already have, like, don't really matter, right? You're like, oh, yeah, no, you're good. You're not lost, you're good. As long as you're not dead, come on, we got to find your brother. I, I mean, are you guys with me on this? See, for me, all that matters in those, in those few moments when I lost Zion was finding Zion. And this is exactly how God the Father feels about people who are missing from his family. Check this out. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God the Father has an absolute love and longing for his children, all children, all people to be with him. He says he wants everyone, that means everyone on the planet, to come to repentance. In fact, this is so much on the heart and on the mind of God the Father that Jesus tells three stories in a row to illustrate the heart of God. Now, some of you guys, if you've been in church, you may have heard these stories before, but let me review them really quickly for you because it's not very often that Jesus tells three different stories in a row, all with the exact same point. So it, 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 these are going to be in Luke 15. I'm just going to kind of summarize them, but it's a whole chapter of the Bible. Luke 15, first he says, imagine there's a guy, there's a shepherd, and he has 100 sheep, and one of those sheep wanders off. 
It says that shepherd will leave the 99 sheep that are, that are safe. He'll leave them and go searching for the one sheep that's lost. He'll look up and down everywhere. And when he finds that lost sheep, he'll grab it and he'll carry it back. And he'll tell all of his friends, hey, guys, check it out. My sheep, it was lost and I found it. Woo, let's celebrate, everybody. It's in the Bible. Look, Luke 15. He's, he's getting excited. He, he found his one sheep. He's like, he didn't really, it's like, they're nine, well, you got nine. It wasn't like, well, you got 99. Who cares? There's one lost. No, he went after the one that was lost. Then he tells a story about this lady. He says, imagine this lady has 10 coins and she loses one of her coins. And so she, she leaves the nine coins on the desk or whatever. And she starts searching her house and she's moving things. And she's checking and she's looking everywhere. She, just, she searches her whole house, turns it upside down until she finds the one coin that was lost. And when she finds that coin, she literally calls up her friends like, hey guys, I found my coin. It was lost. I got it. And they're like, woohoo, high five. They're celebrating because the one, when you lose something, like finding it becomes like the focus of like, like when you lost your phone, you know. And then it tells a story about this father who has two sons, and it says one of the sons wanders off. Uh, not really wanders off, like intentionally leaves. Like, hey, Dad, I'm out. Give me my inheritance. And he takes his money, essentially saying, Dad, you're dead to me. He goes off. The Bible says he engages in wild living. Whatever that means. You can interpret that however you want. So he spends like all of his inheritance money, spends it, runs out of money after partying, and he finds himself hungry. He's like feeding pigs, and he's like, man, I'm starving because there's a famine in the land. And he's like, maybe I should go back to my dad and ask him for forgiveness to tell him I'm sorry. Maybe he was thinking, my dad has servants that are living better than me. Maybe I'll just go back not as his son but as his servant. So the son gets up the courage and he goes back. And the Bible says while, while the son was still a long ways off, the father sees him and runs to him and embraces him. And he's like, son, you're alive. The son's trying to rehearse this speech. Dad, I'm really sorry. Please forgive me. Blah, 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 blah. And the dad's like, party. My son is back. Woo. Hey, kill the cow. We're having a barbecue. And they, they're just like, party, you know. He's telling all of his friends, my son, he was lost, and now he's found. It's like he was dead, but now he's alive. And Jesus tells all three of these stories, back to back to back, I believe, to emphasize this point that lost people matter to God. And when somebody is lost or something is lost, that becomes the focus of what matters in your life. Now, I know this is slightly weird for those of you who, like, don't go to church or would consider yourself, yeah, I'm not, like a follower of Jesus, and we're calling, essentially we're calling you lost. And please don't be offended by that because I know it's like, that's weird. They call me lost person. Just, I want you to understand it from the perspective of, just think about it. Like if God is a father and all the people are in his family and then you're not in his family, you could see how that would you'd be perceived as lost. Does that make sense? You guys with me? So please don't be offended. Please take this in when I refer to people as lost. Is I want you to hear the heart of God for you. If you're not in a relationship, I want you to hear how much God really wants to be in a relationship with you today. And number two, I want you to hear how God wants church people to treat you if you're not a church person. Because what you're going to find, I think, is that it's a little bit different than what you're actually seeing in culture. The way God wants us who follow Jesus to treat people who don't follow Jesus. So, point is this. Lost people matter to God, and I'm convinced they ought to matter to us. In fact, what I want you to do right now is think of a person who you know, a person who you would say you love, you care about, who doesn't follow Jesus. Think of a person... Uh, Brother, sister, aunt, uncle, friend, neighbor, coworker, somebody that you care about who doesn't know Jesus. Uh, everybody got a name, a name in their head? Like, now picture that person's face, picture that person's face. Everybody got somebody? If not, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna keep going. But uh, I want you to keep that person in your mind as we go through this message today. That person who you know, who you love, who would say, yeah, they, either I know they're not in a relationship with God or I don't really think that they are. With that in mind, there's a guy named Paul who wrote much of the New Testament part of the Bible, Paul understood this heart that Jesus was talking about when he talked about how, how lost people matter to God. Paul understood this so much that he devoted his life. See, at one point, Paul like, wasn't following Jesus. He met Jesus, his life got transformed, and then he devoted his life to sharing with other people 
who Jesus was and that they could know him and follow him. And so Paul, one day, he's writing a letter to a church in a town called Corinth. And so this letter is called 1 Corinthians because uh, it's written to a, uh, the church in Corinth. He had some things to say to this church about how we should relate as church people to people who um, don't know Jesus. Check it out. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 19. This should be on the screen for you, but it says this. Even though I'm free... Even though I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Okay, I'm going to pause right there. He says, I'm free. Like, I can do whatever I want. But because I want to help lead these people to Christ, I'm going to become a slave to them. Like, I'm going to spend my life serving these people in order to help them see Jesus. Is essentially what he's saying. I don't have to do this, like, but I'm choosing to change my behavior, my preferences, in order to help lead them towards Jesus. Then he says this, verse 20. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring those to Christ who are, not un, or who are under the law. Verse 21. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. Then he says this. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. So I want you to get really like the, the attitude that he has. is like, I'm just, I want to do whatever I can to help these people like see Jesus. I, I want to live like them, act like them. As long as I'm not sinning, I'm going to adjust my behavior to, to help point them to Jesus. So imagine if we had this same attitude and the purpose of like, what could I do to help people in my work know Jesus? Like how could I relate to people at my work? How could I most effectively lead people at my school to Jesus. Like, how should I relate to people who are in the LGBTQ community to help point them towards Jesus? Not to, like, tell them they're whatever, to, to lead them towards Jesus. How should I relate to people who have opposite political views of me that will help them see Jesus? How should I... Uh, treat my neighbors in order to help reach them for Jesus? How should I treat my kids in order to help my kids to be, become followers of Jesus? How should I act when I'm around people who are of other religions to help them to know Jesus? How should I talk to people on social media to like help point them towards Jesus? Hint, it's not like telling them they're dumb or whatever. <laughs> Essentially, I think what Paul is saying is... I'm willing to do anything short of, other than sin to reach people who are far from God. I think another way that Paul might phrase it if he were talking to today's world of weird diets, he'd say, when I'm with my low-carb peeps, I'm low-carb. You know, when I'm with my ve uh, vegetarian friends, I'm vegetarian. When I'm with my gluten-free friends, oh, I'm gluten-free too. When I'm with my uh, paleo peeps, I'm going to eat paleo. And with the Texans, I'm going to eat steak. I mean, like, what he's saying is like, he's saying if I have to become vegan for the rest of my life in order to reach vegans, I'll never eat meat again. And it has nothing to do with like food. It has everything to do with my heart is like, these people need Jesus. I'm going to do what I can to find common ground so that they'll connect with me. And then I'm going to point them to Jesus. Are you, do you guys see what he's trying to say here? Check it out in the, in the NIV. It says this. 1 Corinthians 9.22 says, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. What, my translation of that is that Paul's saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to reach people who are far from God. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Because when, when a kid is lost, when a son or daughter is lost... I'm going to do whatever it takes to find them. That's what God is saying. And people who are not in relationship with them are like kids who are lost. And so what does that look like for us? What does that mean for us as a church if we're going to be people who do whatever it takes to reach people who are far from God? A couple things. Whatever it takes means that my personal preferences aren't important. Okay? My personal preferences, your personal, they're not, they're just not important. So your food preferences shouldn't matter, and your music preferences shouldn't matter, and your movie preferences shouldn't matter, and your scientific preferences, and your political preferences, and even uh, 
your sexual preferences and your gender preference. Like, we have all these preferences, and we think, like, God says I'm supposed to do this, but until the lost are found, your preferences don't matter. Like, it doesn't matter that this person's behavior, if they don't know Jesus, we were trying to fix their behavior, we should be trying to lead them to Jesus. So we've got to stop acting like our preferences matter when it comes to people who are far from God. I I think that's the heart of what what Paul is saying in this scripture. So the first thing that we're going to realize that my preferences don't matter. The second thing, whatever it takes means, is we need to stop judging and start loving. We need to stop judging people who are outside the church. You might be like, really? Well, check this out. 1 Corinthians, a couple chapters earlier than the same letter that Paul's writing to this church, he says this. And he was addressing like a specific situation about this person in that church who was doing some really uh, inappropriate things. And, And he says this. When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. Some of you guys are like, boom, I knew it was in the Bible. We're not, like those, those people, they have these weird sexual things. We're not even supposed to associate with them. You, you read that verse and you're like, yep, I told you. You know, and all these, whatever. That's, that's why I posted that thing on Facebook or whatever. Um, but wa- look at the next verse. He says, ver- verse 10, but I wasn't talking about unbelievers. He was saying, Don't associate with these people, but he's like, I was talking about church people, not unchurched. He says, I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or who are greedy or who cheat people or who worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. Verse 11 says, I meant that you were not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer. He's talking about there's somebody who's in your small group, and they're like, oh, I love Jesus so much. And then that person is indulging in sexual sin, or they're greedy, or they're worshiping idols, or they're abusive, or they're a drunkard, or they cheat people. He says, don't even eat with such people. Those are the people who you need to judge, you need to confront, you need to talk to, in love, of course, but they're church people. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. Then check out verse 12. This is crazy. He says, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, meaning people who are not in the church. But it certainly is your responsibility to judge those who are in the church. Now, when you look at that whole passage that we just read, I think oftentimes what I see is church people doing the exact opposite. We see people who are our friends in church, and they've got certain things that are maybe not good, and we're like, eh, whatever. But then we see these unchurched people who are living like unchurched people, and we're like, what the heck, man? You could not. That is sinful. You are bad. What's wrong with you? And we're caught in in the world's like, whoa, Christians are haters. What's like that's God saying, don't do that. Don't judge those outside the church. You got to deal with the people inside the church. I feel like a lot of times the American church, like, we're the opposite. It's kind of like if you had a Hindu friend and they were getting mad at you because you weren't following their Hindu ways. And you're like, well, uh, I'm not Hindu. Why would I follow it? I feel like that's what the world feels like towards the church. Like, guys, I don't follow Jesus. I don't need to follow the rules of Jesus. And so well, let me encourage you that we need to stop trying to correct people and first try to connect with people. We've got to connect before we correct. We've got to connect before we correct. And we got to connect people to Jesus before we correct them with Jesus. We're like, look, Jesus said this. You're bad. And they're like, I don't even follow Jesus. Right? We've got to connect first, and then we can get it with the correcting. So the way we say it in student ministry a lot of times is this. You've got to belong before you believe, and you've got to believe before you behave. And a lot of times people flip that. Let me explain. So a kid walks in. Just imagine you're with a bunch of students, and a kid walks in, and they're wearing some inappropriate clothing, and they're dropping some F-bombs or whatever, and people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're in church, dude. You better watch your mouth. Right? Like, a lot of times, church people, they, like, want to correct kids. Like, hey, you need to change. If you're going to, like, be a part of this church, you need to change your behavior. You can't cuss. You can't smoke. You can't blah, blah, blah. And, and I get it. Like, okay, we don't want them, like, punching other kids in the face or whatever. But I feel like if, if, if a kid walks in, they took the risk. That their friend convinced them, you got to come to church with me. You're going to love it, I promise. And they walk in, and then somebody's like, hey, you're bad. You're like, whoa, okay, just kidding. I'm not coming back to this church anymore. But I, I believe that we need to 
allow them to belong first. So if, no matter what, no matter what they look like, talk like, I mean, as long as they're not like literally hurting somebody else, we're going to welcome you into the family. Like no matter what, you, you belong here. You're a part of the family. You're loved. You're welcomed. We love you. So what, when, what happens when we do that and kids feel like, wow, these people actually are friendly. They actually like me. They want to be my friend. Then it opens up their heart to believe the message we're talking about Jesus. So then their heart opens because they feel like they belong, and then they believe the message. And once they believe the message that we're talking about Jesus, their behavior will naturally follow because then the Holy Spirit will come, and he'll begin to change their heart, and they'll be like, oh, maybe I should change my language. Oh, maybe I should change the way I'm treating people. Oh, and, and, and we flip it. We're like, behave, and then believe, and then you can belong and be a part of our club. we got to flip that. Like, you belong no matter what, then they'll believe, and then their behavior will follow. I think if we could approach it like that, the world, we'd start seeing tons of people getting reached for Jesus. Um, so we're on a mission to reach Denver, whatever it takes. That means we've got to stop judging people and start loving those who are outside the church. The third thing this means, whatever it takes means, is that we are willing to change. Okay? The method must change the message must not. Check this out. The way church was designed 25 years ago and even five years ago isn't the most effective way to reach people today. In fact, the younger generations and every generation probably coming after them is actually more comfortable watching on a screen than they are in person. You see, times are changing and they're changing fast. A couple of months ago, Taylor Swift came out with a music video to this song called Look What You Made Me Do. This thing broke all sorts of records on YouTube. Within its first 24 hours, there were 42.3 million views of this video. That's over 3 million views per hour, over 30,000 views per minute. I mean, what this indicates to me is that the world is changing and, and we can get things out faster, we can get messages out faster than ever before. Imagine the potential for the gospel. If we could get the message of Jesus out using these new methods, literally hundreds of millions of people could get the message within days. Hey, I know I'm on screen and not live and in person, but go with me on this. Repeat after me. The methods must change. Okay, come on, come on. I need everybody participating here. Repeat after me. The methods must change. The, must change. the message must not. The must not. Awesome. See, you guys did it. You went with me even though I'm on a screen. You guys are giving me hope because if we're going to do whatever it takes to reach people who are far from God, we've got to be willing to change our approach all the time. <clears throat> yeah. So if you haven't noticed, we live in a changing world, okay? Uh, th this thing uh, came out called a couple years ago called a smartphone. I believe the smartphone has changed everything. Today, check this out. Today, more people are using phones than toothbrushes. Um, true story. Today, 46% of 18 to 24-year-olds would pick Internet access over having a car. Today, almost half of 18 to 24 year olds, I'd say, checks out a million people, uh, a million teenagers specifically per year take selfies. No, actually, not per year, per day. A million selfies per day are taken by teenagers. And check this out because of that, there's more people every year that die from selfies than from shark attacks. <laughs> they're, they're like taking a picture and they like fall off a cliff and. It's crazy, but it's true. Check this out. 42% of 0 to 8-year-olds own their own tablet. 42% of 0-year-olds <laughs> own their own tablet. What a, the world is changing, okay? If you're 14, check If you're 14 years old right now as a toddler, you probably taught your grandparents how to use Skype. If you're 15, Google has literally always been there your whole life, and you treat Wi-Fi as an entitlement. Like when I was growing up, Wi-Fi was like magic. It, like, it was like, what? You can just magically, a movie comes out of thin air, and I can watch it on a computer? Today, kids are like, what the, what's wrong with this building? They don't have Wi-Fi, <laughs> right? If you're 16 years old, check this out. You've probably never seen a billboard ad for cigarettes, and you've never had to watch shows at a scheduled time. You're like, what? I got to watch this at Tuesday at 7 o'clock? 
<laughs> what the heck is this? Right? Like, people who are older, are, like, we think, I mean, all that to say the world's changing. Like, everything's changing, and we've got to be willing to change our methods as a church if we're going to reach people in a changing world. Anybody heard of a company called Kodak? Okay. Um, Kodak is one of these companies that for over 100 years, they dominated the photographic industry. For, for much of the, that 100 years, they had like 89% of the market share in the photography and photograph business. And they're, they're just going along. And in fact, they were so popular and so dominant as a company that their advertising slogan, we're talking about a Kodak moment, literally just became part of the American vernacular and language, right? Well... In 1975, one of the Kodak engineers came to the leadership at Kodak and he had invented the first digital camera. And he's like, check this out. You know, this is going to be awesome. And they're like, oh, that, that's nice, but don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> Literally, that's, he said that's what they said. And so they kind of were like, no, we're, we're not doing that. We're, we're in the photograph business. We're, we're, we're like in the real picture, not like digital, whatever that is. Well, they began a slow decline, you know, and pretty soon, fast forward from 1975 to 2012, Kodak filed for bankruptcy in 2012 because they didn't change. They, like the times were changing and things were changing and they, their engineer invented the thing that now everybody has digital pictures, you know, and, and they, they, I don't know what happened, but what I... What that makes me think of is, is the church, that if the church isn't willing to identify times are changing, we need to be willing to change, we're not going to become bankrupt, but we might die as a church. Every year in America, 4,000 churches close their doors and die. One of the reasons is because they're not willing to change as times change. Not, we're not changing the message. We're not changing the Bible. What we're changing is our approach and our method of how we're going to connect with people and how we're going to reach people. We've got to be like the men of Issachar. In, in 1 Chronicles, there's this tribe from Issachar. It says, check out 1 Chronicles 12, 32. It says, from Issachar, there were 200 leaders and all their relatives at their command. It said they understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. We need to be like them. They understood the times, like, oh, man, times are changing. Okay, so then they knew what they should do. We've got to understand the culture, the times of what's happening, and understand the heart of God so that we can know how to best approach people to reach them for Jesus. Um, so Summit, I propose that, I don't really propose, I just, th this is what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to be a church that takes risks, that's willing to, to change, uh, that does things like, you know, has sermon clips on video with a Taylor Swift song in it. You know, we have an online campus where people in France can experience church with us. We're going to probably experiment with this thing called multi-site church. We're going to do this thing called small groups. Some of you guys are like, small groups? That's not like cutting edge, cultural. And know what I'm learning is that in today's, like, hyper-connected world, like everybody's connected digitally and virtually online, small groups, which give us like actual face-to-face, -face, like you can hug the person there, like are going to be one of the most effective ways to reach people because like real, actual face-to-face -face relationships. We did this thing last weekend called Trunk or Treat, leveraging this cultural phenomenon called Halloween, which some church people are like, that's bad, that's evil, we can't do that. But we're like, dude, we're not worshiping the devil. We're, we're doing whatever we can to find common ground with people who have kids that want free candy. And hundreds of people came, and we connected with them, hopefully with the purpose of pointing them towards Jesus. You guys, it wasn't sin what we did at Trunk or Treat, and we connected with a lot of people. And I believe that's the heart of Jesus, the heart of God, the Father, the heart of Paul that says we got to do whatever it takes to reach people that are far from God, even if it means giving them free candy. I mean... Paul said, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I believe this needs to be our heart. So I believe as we do this, God will use us to reach people that are far from Christ, to raise them up in him, and then release them for his mission. Now, if you do all that, there's actually a bonus. Check this out. There's one bonus for you, then we'll wrap this up. The bonus is that when we do whatever it takes... We're going to experience the power and the presence of God in our lives like never before. I really believe that. When, when we get in the game, when we sink our heart up with God's heart and begin to do these things, 
we will begin to experience God in ways we haven't previously experienced God. Let me give you two really famous verses where Jesus is kind of telling us our mission as a church. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Okay, so that's Jesus saying, here's your mission. Go and make disciples, okay? Then he, Acts 1.8, kind of in conjunction with that, Jesus is talking to his disciples and says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, those two verses, if we take them together, Jesus is saying, hey, hey, here's your mission. You need to go, reach people, tell them the story of me and how I died and rose from the dead, and then teach them everything you know about following me, and then send them out to go and do the same thing with other people. Okay? So that, that's kind of like every church's mission. Well, well, there's two things I want to point out in this really quickly. Is that He says, at the end of where he says, go and make disciples, he says, and I'm with you always. And they're kind of like, well, isn't God, even if we're not making disciples, does that mean God isn't with us? And I believe that God is always with us. But I think there's something unique about when you get on mission and begin to actually make disciples, that God is with you in a way that's different than when he's with you at other times. And in Acts, it actually says the reason he gives you power, the power of the Holy Spirit, is so that you can be a witness, not so that... Not for anything else, and that's part of making disciples. That's part of reaching people and raising people and releasing people. And so I'm convinced that when you're on mission doing this, whether in your individual life or in the church, you're going to experience God's power moving in your life, his presence in a unique way where you're like, huh, this is different. That's what happened to me. I started to like, taste that, like being used by God, and I'm like, dude. I, I almost, it's like I became addicted to it. Anyways, um, if you, I believe if you really want to experience the power and the presence of God in your life, you got to get on mission with this attitude of I'm going to do whatever it takes to reach people who are far from God. Um, back in 1989, 1989, there was an earthquake in Armenia. Okay, This earthquake was massive. It, when it hit, within minutes of it hitting, 30,000 people died in this earthquake. It was crazy. I mean, it was uh, 18 years ago, so you might not remember it, but this is a true story about there's this dad. The earthquake hit. He was okay, and, and, and all of a sudden, he's like, I got to go find my son. His son was in high school, so he goes, like, he goes walking. There's rubble everywhere. There's fires. Every, buildings are collapsed, and as he's walking towards his son's school, he remembers this time when his kid was younger. And he said, son, I'm going to be there for you no matter what. I'll be there for you. And he remembers this, and, he, and he, so he, he finds the school, and he's in the school, just rubble. And he's just like, he, like hopelessness just kind of overcomes him. He's like, oh, my gosh, I'm never going to find my son. But he remembers. He told his son, I'm always going to be there for you. And so he goes, and he finds, like, the corner of the school where he remembered his son's classroom was. And he began digging through the rubble. And he, he grabbed all these other parents. Hey, come on, help me. I'm going to dig and try to find these kids. Help me. Come on, come on, come on. And he's rallying all these parents. And so for hours, they're moving rocks and digging in the rubble. They're trying to, like, find their kids. And after a couple hours, some of the other parents are like, eh, it's hopeless. And they gave up. And they went away, and he just stayed there, and he's still digging. And then some police came by, and they're like, hey, I don't think you're really going to find anything. You should, you should go home. It's not really safe to be out here. And he was like, no, why don't, what are you talking about? What, come help me. Come help me find my son. i got to find my son. Come on, help me. And, and they're, they're like, whatever. The, they leave. His hours go by, and he's digging, and he's digging. Some firemen come by because there were some explosions happening from pipes, and everything was broken. The firemen were like, hey, you got to leave. Like, this is dangerous. You're going to get hurt if you keep on digging here. And he's like, what are you talking about? Why don't you come help me find my son? And the firemen are like, they tried, they're, they're literally trying to pull him like, no, sir, you, you need to leave. And he's like, I'm not leaving. I got to find my son. So he digs and digs and digs. True story. After 39 hours of searching, um, the, the guy could barely like move. You know, he's like exhausted. He could barely move another rock. He's exhausted. He's emotional. He's, you know, distraught. He hears the faint sound of what he thinks is his son. He's like, oh, Armand, Armand. And he hears him and he, and he, he gets revitalized, starts digging. He calls, hey guys, come on, I think I found him. Well, they, it, they actually found his son, Armand, with 13 other kids. And somehow like when the earthquake hit, they formed like a, this type of thing where 
all these kids were safe under all the rubble. Not necessarily safe, but they weren't dead, you know. And so they, they dug them all out. And as they, uh, I want to get this right, as they pulled the last kid out, Armand was the last kid that came out. He comes out. He's like, I told them, Dad, you would come for me. And uh, I believe that's what the heart of the Father is towards us, you know, towards his kids who are lost. God's like, I'm coming for you. If you're not in the family of God, like God is, a, is like a father who's like, I'm going to search until I find you. And I think God is looking for churches who are going to say, I'm in. We're going to be in. We're, that's our mission. We're going to do whatever it takes to reach people who are far from God. And I believe God wants to use us. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants to use Summit Church to reach hundreds, maybe thousands of people in Denver who are far from God. And so I want you to think about that person who I asked you to think about at the beginning this morning, that name. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's, you know, a teammate. Maybe it's somebody at your school, somebody in your family, a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister. Like, somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Like, my question for you is, are you willing to do whatever it takes to help them understand the heart of God towards them, to help them come to know Jesus. Because I know that we are, like our, this is our heartbeat as a church. And so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna set aside our preferences in order to reach people who are far from God. We're gonna stop judging those people who are outside the church, start loving them, and we're gonna be willing to change in order to reach them. We've been given this mission by Jesus. My question for you, what are you willing to do about it. So the way we're going to end is I'm going to ask everybody to close your eyes and bow your heads. We're going to pray. But before we pray, I want you to think about this. Just take 30 seconds and what's your next step? Like if you're going to do whatever it takes, as a, either individually or as a part of this church, like what's, what do you need to do? Maybe you need to stop judging people. Maybe you need to set aside certain preferences that you have. Maybe you need to change something in your life. Maybe it's something else. I don't know what it is, but just take 30 seconds and think about, like, what's, what, what's my next step in getting in the game on this? Father God, uh, I love you. Thank you for your heart towards us, that you love us so much that you would leave the 99 to come searching for one when they're lost. God, thank you that you are a father who, who loves us no matter how messed up we are, no matter how sinful we are. God, I pray that you would help us as a church to, to just get that heart and run with it. God, help us to, to take some steps towards doing whatever it takes to, to reach people who are far from you, God. And uh, we can't do it on our own, God. We need your help, your courage, your power to be able to be who you've called us to be and do what you've called us to do. Help us in that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, <clears throat> hey, thank you guys so much for being here today. Before we're done, a couple more, more things. Uh, during this next song, we're going we're gonna to do this thing we call offering. That's just us giving back to God a little bit of the money that he's blessed us with. So if you're new, don't feel any pressure. If you're not new, don't feel any pressure. This is literally like one of the ways we worship God is through giving of our money. So there's going to be a basket that comes around. You can drop some money in there. Or if you're like, if you're one of those modern people who learned how to change with the times, you could do it on the website. You could do it with an app. Like, you know, there's other ways or you could just be old school but uh <clears throat> anyways if you can do that with a heart of of worship saying man god you're first in my life with joy th then do that if not just hand it to the person next to you it's all good so uh they're gonna pass those as we do this last song here we go